Let's talk about closed communion. Closed communion. The whys and the wherefores, etc. So, the biblical confessional practice of the Lutheran Church is closed communion. The biblical canonical practice of the Roman Catholic Church is closed communion. The biblical canonical practice of the Eastern Orthodox Church is closed communion. So, if you take a look at Rome in the East, they represent three quarters of world Christianity. Three quarters of world Christianity practices closed communion, and they don't even blink twice at it. Okay? So if you're Catholic, you only receive communion at a Roman Catholic church. If you're Catholic, you don't take communion somewhere else. If you're not Catholic, you're not supposed to commune, not supposed to, at a Roman Catholic church. Same with Eastern Orthodox. The Lutheran Church, which is the Church of the Reformation, the actual Lutheran Church of the Reformation, right, was, the purpose was to reform the Roman Catholic Church. So they kept doing the same thing. It's also biblical, which would be a reason to do that. The prime reason to do that would be that it's biblical. And it's confessional. So it's a part of the Lutheran confessions that we don't have fellowship outside of the actual unity um, of faith, um, which is meaning the same confession of faith. So Lutherans, and particularly Missouri Synod Lutherans, because Missouri Synod has, from 1839 in the Saxon immigration until, until and this, this is arguable until the 60s, 1960s, the LCMS, the Missouri Synod, was the stronghold of Orthodox Lutheranism. Okay. For most current Missouri Synod people, we would say we still are. I say it's arguable because the Wisconsin Synod and the ELS, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, and the CLC, Church of the Lutheran Confession, they would argue that we were that and that we have given that up since about the 40s until the present, but we can get that back and they want us to get that back. That's another class. But closed communion, and evidence of, of the fact that that's what we do, is that it's in every small catechism edition. It's in the current one. It's in the one from the 90s. It's in the blue one from the 70s. It was in the one before that. Um, it's, always, it's always been in the explanation of our small catechism. Um, and um, I, of course, didn't bring one with me, but I can, I can show that to you. There's probably one on the shelves. Here's what closed communion is. Closed communion says that if you are confirmed communicant, whoops, Communicant, confirmed communicant, member of this church or of a church in fellowship with the LCMS. So that would be another LCMS congregation or one of the world Lutheran bodies in altar and pulpit fellowship with this. So I'll just write LCMS fellowship. Then you can commune at an LCMS church. This should be kind of a no-brainer that because what's in a name? Well, just everything, right? Like when we go to the grocery store, we don't go to a, a nondescript blank warehouse with no title, no name, no nothing, and go down aisles of brown, identical packages with no name and just guess what's milk and what's green beans. You know, the label tells you what's on the inside. Same thing here. Denominational labels exist because denomination, that word itself from the Latin means to name something, to, to identify what, what that something is. Denominations have names to identify what's on the inside. So if you are LCMS, 
then you commune. LCMS. If you're Roman Catholic, you commune. Roman Catholic. If you're Eastern Orthodox, you commune. Eastern Orthodox. If you're Methodist, you commune Methodist. Now, there are denominations that, because they fall within the reform camp, have broadened this. Okay? But there's a reason why. Reform denominations like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, non-denominational. Non-denominational is a denomination, by the way, which is awesome if you think about it. Um, reform denominations deny sacramental theology because, and it's in various ways and means. There are nuances. But overall, because they deny sacramental theology, communion isn't the same. Okay? And Luther writes about this in the Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration 7, where he says of the sacramentarians, there was a controversy, and those called sacramentarians, they weren't called that because they were sacramental, they were anti-sacramental. So the sacramentarians had spoken against sacramental theology. Luther says of them, he's quoted in Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration 7. He had already passed away by then. But he's quoted there uh, in an earlier resource. He's quoted in there saying, we don't have fellowship with them. We, 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 we. And, um, and there's a whole thing in Formula of Concord 7 about that that we're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you we're going to get into. But first... I'm going to do what is the practice, and then, okay, what's the history, and how did we, we get there? So, I'm using this term, closed, on purpose, because it's correct. Now, there's a term that's been kicked around in the LCMS for some decades now that's not correct. And it's called close. Okay. And here's what happened. Starting in the late 1920s, early 1930s, some liberalizing influences began to enter the LCMS. Okay? And these liberalizing influences began with the whole historical critical method of interpreting scripture. What that is, is it was developed over in Europe. It's, it's kind of a child of the Enlightenment. Okay? The historical critical method says that the Bible is not God's word, but God's word is in there, and we can use literary techniques like we do on other written works. We use literary techniques to determine what parts of it are scripture and what parts of it aren't. And if you've ever heard anybody talk about the JEDP theory, okay, um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Yaoist and so forth, that's where that comes from. Uh, what they do is they say, well, based on the, the names and titles used for God in the Old Testament, we think... That, for example, Moses didn't write the whole first five books of the Bible, and so and so and so and so and so. And so. But rather, we think that there were four traditions. And the four traditions, and wherever you go in the Old Testament, you find God called Yahweh. That's the Yahwist tradition. And it didn't come from different chronological times. It came way, way much more recent, and it's from this school of thought that was whatever. By the way, this whole thing is completely made up, just so you understand kind of the context. The whole thing's made up. But it was like the hot thing in the late 1800s in Europe, and it filtered over here. And then it even kind of threw some more liberal reform denominations in their schools, started seeping into the LCMS. And some, this, this kind of became sort of a, hmm, first you kind of wink, wink, looked at it, because, yeah, it's not faithful, but it's what's happening now. I just want to check it out. I can filter this. And then they look at it some more, and then they start believing it, and then it ends up in the St. Louis Seminary, and then we have Seminex, okay, um, in the 70s. Starts in the 20s and 30s. By the 40s, by 19, actually by 1935, the LCMS is wanting to be like kind of all ecumenical and start having talks with the ALC. And, um, you know, we're, we're saying, you know, hey, the differences between us aren't really terrible differences. Well, Wisconsin and the ELS are like, yeah, those are actual differences. We don't have fellowship. The LCMS want to do ecumenical. Let's all be one thing. 
And by the by 1955-1960, first the ELS and then Wisconsin Senate and Broke Fellowship with the LCMS. There used to be something called the Synodical Conference. It was the LCMS, Wisconsin, the ELS, and SELC, the Slovak Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um, those four were the core of the Synodical Conference, formed in 1872. It finally died in the 60s because the LCMS was kind of flirting with the ALC, American Lutheran Church, which itself was flirting with historical critical method. And even some voices were starting to talk about, let's look into maybe women's ordination, or at least talk about. And Wisconsin ELS backed off. They separated. They still are separate today from the LCMS. When they did that, that left the LCMS and the Slovak Lutheran Church, Evangelical Lutheran Church, as the only people in the Synodical Conference. Well, Selk in 1971 or two becomes a non-geographic district of the Missouri Synod. There's no reason to have a conference and it shuts down. So ironically, it was the push for ecumenism, 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 inclusivism, <laughs> that ruined the inclusivism and shut down the conference. So by 1974, there actually were professors at the St. Louis Seminary teaching the historical critical method and actually telling seminarians, by the way, when you go home, don't talk about this, that we're teaching this. By the way, don't tell anybody you're learning this, but this is actually right. Which is, and and, and when, when people did leak it out, when people did find out, there was a huge uproar, and the people teaching the historical critical method staged a walkout, and they called the local television news, and they vested, and they carried a processional cross, and they processed in protest in front of the cameras off the campus. And when they turned the cam cameras off, they went back and they had lunch at the seminary, and life went on. Um, but that's called the walkout. Um, they called it seminex, seminary in exile. They got the Jesuits, who've always been historically liberal in the Catholic realm. They got them to give them space. They moved the seminary over there. Well, they moved the people over there who were doing historical critical method and actually granted diplomas that were not certified and not anything because they had left, gave them Seminex um, diplomas. And I've seen them and stuff, seen these diplomas. Anyway, so St. Louis revamps, uh, brings back faithful people, installs them as professors, and we've been in a cleanup ever, ever since. And that whole thing, beginning with... Um, uh, ecum uh, ecumenism in the uh, 30s has us where we are today, where we have these worship wars between contemporary worship and liturgy, and um, vestments, not vestments, and all of that stuff that's still going on is a product of, and Wisconsin and the ELS, it's not that they haven't had their own problems. Wisconsin has worship wars right now, but they don't have as much toleration of for example, open communion, as the LCMS has. And Wisconsin and the ELS, you know, various pastors, not the organizations, but various pastors in those organizations have said to me personally, we be LCMS, except the LCMS tolerates false teachings and false teachers. And open communion is the main thing they point at. And they have a point. We have congregations practicing open communion, and really almost nobody's doing anything about it. Um, and, uh, and they need to. So, in the midst of all of that, beginning in the late 50s, this word starts popping up in reference to communion because they were progressives were looking to bridge the gap <coughs> between open and close. And they came up with this, and they usually put a parenthesis here and a parenthesis there, close parenthesis. They usually do it like that. And they say, well, actually, what we practice is close communion. And the way they define this is, if you're confirmed communicant member and you have, you have LCMS fellowship, you can commune here, or under special circumstances, dot, 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 pastoral privilege, oh, privilege, allows you to make an exemption. What happens when you start down a slippery slope? Yeah, that you, you, you go to the bottom. Yeah. All right. So 
and, and the, the, the special circumstances they usually talk about, because this is still argued about today, the special circumstances they talk about, well, what if, you know, um, poor Aunt Bessie, who left the LCMS a while back, and now she's XYZ Church, whatever that is, it's Reform, but she's dying, she's in town to visit, and something happened, she's dying, and she wants communion. The push for these people, the push is, well, you can make a special exemption because she's dying. So in other words, you teach your people correct theology their whole life, but at the point of death, it's okay to fall down on it. Yeah. Uh, what? But you said she had been confirmed Missouri Synod before, so can she have... If she's been confirmed, with, I'm, I'm a, she's I'm not a, a person a, like that. I'm, I'm straight for over 50 years, but yeah. I was confirmed well, Missouri Synod, and yeah. I come back, and I'm taking yeah. soul's communion. Because you're a communicant member of grace. Yeah. So you're confirmed, and you're a communicant member. She's not. She's a member of XYZ Church, and she has fellowshiped with them, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the difference. But that's, that's why that's a great question. Um, she is not in fellowship with the LCMS and has freely chosen to not have that fellowship. Um, so she could return to fellowship through, um, through um, confession of faith. Yes, I believe what's taught and preached at this altar. Yes, I want to be... Okay, now she can commune. But um, this is the load of hoo-ha that it sounds like. And it became an open door for open communion because the fact is, a door is open or closed, it's not close. <laughs> a light is off or on, it's not close. Communion is closed or open, it's not close. So, Pastor, uh -huh. the book says that close, close and closed are mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's because of the source of the book. It's not. And again, it's kind of obvious. Is the door open or closed? It's open. It's not close. There isn't any close. It's open or closed. Are the lights off or on? They're not close. They're either they're off or they're on. Yeah. So Wells and ELS won't fellowship with us because we tolerate it. Yes. But the polity of the LCMS is, seems pretty weak to the congregation. So how do you correct a congregation that is practicing close community? Yeah. So under the under the LCMS system. Um, under the LCMS system, right, there are, there are pastors, then there's a circuit visitor. Circuit visitor is elected by the pastor to be the pastor of the pastors, but he also has supervisory authority. And he's actually supposed to work with them on this stuff as your first kind of line of defense of doctrine. And he's supposed to kind of say, hey, buddy, you know, what you're doing is actually not kosher, correct, and you really ought to correct. And if the person doesn't correct, you keep trying. And then maybe you get the district president involved, because the circuit visitor is the representative of the district president. And so then you get the DP involved. The DP is supposed to correct it. The DP has the authority to tell an erring pastor, you have to get in line with what we're doing, or you face discipline. And that discipline can include suspension. It doesn't have to be getting tossed. You know, it can be, can be suspension or whatever to kind of bring people back in line. But, the, but in practice, it doesn't happen much. And it doesn't happen much because of the fear of numbers. We don't want congregations going away. We don't want pastors going away. And so in practice, um, guys will get talked to, and they'll uh, reach an understanding where a guy will promise to do better but doesn't, and nothing else ever happens. And that's a real... Uh, issue for this um, next election um, because the election of, of Reverend Dr. Matt Harrison was supposed to address this. And his methodology, which I don't disagree with, his methodology has been we need to give people the time to learn because an entire more than a generation of pastors learned, learned wrong and actually think they're right, and actually think the new guys coming out and the former guys before them are wrong. Are wrong. <coughs> are wrong. Excuse me. 
So we need, cause, because they don't under even understand, they were taught wrong and don't understand why this is wrong, we need to give them, and um, what the voices are growing louder now that, okay, you know, it's been several years, you know, <laughs> time to kind of get with the, so, um, and of course the, uh, the, whatever you want to call them, the people that, that blatantly favor open communion and contemporary worship, stuff like that, are actually running a campaign, which you know about because you found the link, um, uh, called um, Imagine Disaster. No, it's called Imagine, what's it called? Imagine some kind of silliness. It's got a John Lennon title imagine. followed by something they found somewhere in one or two words in the Bible. Imagine Jesus, is that what? Yeah, imagine, I don't know, imagine possibly. Better. Basically, there was a Jesus First movement um, that existed, um, and then um, they got called out. So that sort of morphed into Congregations Matter, sort of. And then that got called out, and that was really obvious. And then, so now it's kind of morphed into this. It's imagine immeasurably more. Yeah, imagine immeasurably more. That's what it is. Yeah, imagine immeasurably more. More what? Who knows? But, um, you know, and imagine, you know. But anyway. And immeasurably. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, the whole thing. And, and, um, and, you know, and a lot of this is generationally driven because the generation that came through seminary uh, from the late 60s through Seminex, you know, into the late 70s before the correction, that, that, time frame, that's a lot of guys that went through the seminary. And uh, President Harrison just, he's very open about it. He's got nothing to hide. He talked at the Rocky Mountain District Conference about this and said, you have to have compassion on these guys. They learned wrong and don't know that they learned wrong. And you need to give them time to hear about why something else is right. And by the way, it's not just that the pastors learned wrong, but that they also went out and taught everybody wrong so that guys come along like myself I've experienced this come along and then find congregations taught the other way and you're like uh and then you're the bad guy for bringing the right thing when and it's it's if you just look historically you can see that it's a this super recent this only this time frame thing that this kind of stuff's even flirted with this this language does not appear in the LCMS pre Seminex era. It's always closed. It's always closed. Yeah. Hi. Hey. 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 Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at uh, Lance. Where's that reference in the book so we can look at it? Three sixty one. Three sixty one. Thank you. Because we haven't gotten that far yet. And I have in my book. Let's go to 361. 361. Yeah. So, lest anyone take it to their harm, they are, uh, let's back up. Since one may partake of the Lord's Supper to their harm, the church practices closed communion. Closed communion is the sharing of the Lord's Supper by those of the same confession of the Lord. Those who confess Christ crucified in every article of the faith are invited to partake of the Lord's Supper. Those who have a different confession should not partake of the Lord's Supper. One cannot confess Christ in one article of the faith and deny him in another article of the faith. That is a contradiction. Okay? All right. Lest anyone take it to their harm, they are asked not to commune. Closed communion is often called close communion. These two terms mean the same thing. It is close, not in the sense of we believe close to the same thing, but that those who commune are close together or intimate. I've never, ever heard that before. Okay, this is the kind of hedging and fudging that got us to where we are. <laughs> you don't have to hedge and fudge. You don't have to make apologies for doing and believing the right thing. Just do and believe the right thing. I have never, in seminary, in talking about all this, Never once did anybody talk like that. That's mush. And it, it's, it's, it's just, it's weaselly. And there's no reason to do that. There's not a reason in the world. In other words, they share a common confession and faith. Okay? The practice of open communion, where all are freely admitted to the Lord's Supper, okay? that's, not what can, not, that's not what open communion is. Open communion can be that. Open communion is where 
anyone is freely admitted to the Lord's Supper. Not just all, but anyone, including those of a different confession, admitted to the Lord's, is a, and it says it, it's a recent practice in the Christian church, okay, in which the confession of Christ crucified in every article of faith is not recognized or highly treasured. This comes to us again out of progressive or what might be called more liberal forms of reform theology where they deny sacrament. If it's not a sacrament, it's not super special, it's not super critical that you can't commune. Somebody, it doesn't matter who, went on vacation. Who told me the story? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, went on vacation, just visited a congregation and they just kind of set up community and everybody could come have it. Oh, you, yeah. you saw that, you saw that. So that's an, ex that's an example of open communion. Um, or let's say in your congregation, you have people who are, one spouse is LCMS and one spouse is something else, anything else, but the anything else spouse is also communion in your church, that's open communion. You don't do that. They have a different confession. You don't do that. That's open communion. It's really straightforward. It's not hard. We only try to make it hard because we want to get what we want. <laughs> we don't want to follow the rules. That's basic rebellion. Um, but it's it's not tough. What's open and what's closed is is it's just it's not it's not hard. So um, now let's talk about why this is an issue. Let's go to your Bible, and uh, we'll wrap up in a little bit. Since we don't have confirmation, I thought, well, this is a really important topic. We can kind of cover this a little bit. I'm gonna go. I'll bring. We'll bring in Formula of Concord and stuff next time. I knew we wouldn't get to it. But um, let's take a look scripturally. The scriptural basics. They're so cute. They're awesome. Oh, man. Little ones filled with joy and wonder. You know, of the world. And then they turn into teenagers. Oh. Um, <laughs> and then crabby adults. <laughs> I tell you what, though. I'm enjoying You know what I just found out? So I was playing racquetball yesterday morning. And some older gentlemen come who in their 70s and 80s still play racquetball, and I'm like, whoa, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. I want to be doing that. In my 70s and 80s, I want to play racquetball. And this guy came up, and he said, and, uh, we were just chatting about racquetball, and he said, hey, do you know about the Huntsman Games or something like that, the Huntsman Games, St. George? I said, no, what is this? He said, it's, it's master's sports for, uh, for older people. He said, I go down there every year and I play racquetball and they rank you nationally. He said, there were 11,000 people who came this year. I was like, what? How did I not hear about something with 11,000 people playing sports? He said, yeah, they do like racquetball. They do, um, uh, what's the uh, the new paddle game on the tennis court, but it's a pickleball. They do pickleball. They do track. Yeah, they do track. yeah. track? yeah. It's yeah. like they play pinochle. I'm like, okay. <laughs> You could probably pull something playing pinochle if you don't do it right. But, um, and, and this guy, he tells me all this wonderful stuff. I'm like, I'm excited. But I said, I'm only 54. He's like, no, no, that's okay. It's Masters, you know, 50 and older. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm, very much. I to, I'm going. I totally want to do this. I'm so excited. Anyway, and I also want my discount. Well, you have to be 55, right? 55? Do you get, when do you get your discount? 54. I want my discount. Come on, I want, I want my discount. I don't care. I'm not proud. I want my discount. Anyway, all right. First Corinthians 10. I mean, I'm super excited about this. It sounds like you know what they are. The Huntsman Games. Have you been around for a decade at least? Wow. Well, see, I just moved here in 2015, so I, yeah. But um, wow, I'm super. Do you do you go? Oh, you don't. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. I, I just think it's great. Anyway, First Corinthians 10. Uh, blah, 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 14, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 10, 14. Therefore, my beloved, sorry, I didn't give you time to, are you there? Okay. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry, okay? Notice, we're fleeing from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Okay, so you have wine and blood. This is sacramental theology straight out of the Bible. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? You've got bread and body. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the 
one bread. Communion is not, as the Reformed teach, is not your personal act of obedience between you and your Jesus, demonstrating your internal faith. Communion is, as the Bible says, that which makes us one. It is sacramental in actually forgiving your sins and saving you, and in unifying us as the body of Christ. Well, the, the, the thumb isn't over here believing one thing, and this finger isn't over here believing another thing, and this eyeball's back there believing another. The body believes the same thing. They confess Christ in every article the same thing. The unity that Jesus prays for in the Gospel of John is the unity shared with the Father. Well, the Father and the Son don't have different ideas about what communion is. They don't have different ideas about who should be ordained and not. They don't have different ideas about anything because it's one God. And the unity prayed for is, is a unity of a confession in every article of faith, or there's not unity by definition of what unity means. Okay? So because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? So intrinsically, inherently, idols aren't anything. But what's believed about them is critically important. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Where does bad theology come from? Demons. Where did the first sin come from? Satan. Right? I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So the unity of faith required for communion is full unity in every article. Now, a fair question will be raised, what if I don't know every article? That's fair. The fair question will be raised, what about somebody who's struggling with an article of faith and, and they don't know? Uh, that's a good question, too. Submitting one's self to the pastoral care of the shepherd in that place and submitting oneself to fellowship with that altar says, I may not know it all, or I may have questions, but there's my authority, there's my fellowship, I have unity with that. Church membership is your public confession of faith. Church membership and I don't mean only signing on the line, but where you attend regularly is where your church membership is. Okay? Um, and so that's critically, critically important. So, when someone comes and they say, Hi, I'm from the Rock Church, and I want to take communion today. I, uh, that hasn't happened. But if it happened, I could say to them, Wow, welcome! Here's my card. I'm Pastor Massinelli. Thank you for coming. Listen, there's a whole thing here. It's going to be really different than what you're used to. It's called liturgy. And, it, and it's historical, and it's biblical, and it's catechetical, and it makes disciples. And it's going to be different. But that helps me explain to you that there's a lot here that's actually different. And we ask that you not commune until you've had instruction on what those differences are so that you can make an informed decision. Do I want to have fellowship with this or do I want to stay there? Yes. I also wanted to comment just about not knowing every article or whatever. Yeah. And we were looking in 1 Corinthians 10 about, and there's, there starts to be some language of the members of the body. I mean, you just kind of gave uh -huh. the example of it. Yeah. A couple of chapters on, uh, there's the, the famous yeah. passage about all the members. and oh, does, yeah. does one not do one? And that's the thing. By It's not just a declaration that I am in fellowship with these, but you then also can participate in the body and strength, and you have a pastor, you have 
fellow congregants, people who, if you don't know them, you have other people with you who do. Yeah. Uh, you know, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles? No, yeah. you don't have to because you are participating with that body in fellowship. So there is a strength in that. That's right. There, there is. And, and you have, because you've declared fellowship here, you have time to learn. You have time to work out things. Time to learn and grow. That's all fine. That's, that's no issue whatsoever. I apologize, Pastor. I have a commitment. To go right. No, go right ahead. Uh, we're we're sort we've sort of run over, yeah. kind of taking advantage of the no confirmation class <laughs> today. I'm sorry. Thank I you. No, no. Thank you for the phenomenal questions because that opened the door to all of this great discussion um, about closed community. And I think we'll pause here because next week I'll bring the formula of Concord, solid declaration, and we'll we'll dig into that. Because many people are really surprised by what Luther says there. Um, because this question of what is it at the altar, actually, for Luther and for the church, is a, is a dividing line between what's Christian and what's not. And nobody in America <laughs> wants to hear that, pretty much. Because, but we don't realize how much we've been affected by sort of a general uh, ecumenism that's, that's uh, been floating around since the, the 20s. Um, but there, there was a time when, when closed communion, the way I've described it, and the way the book describes it, with every article of faith agreed upon, that was perfectly normal for every denomination. This is a new, mid-late 20th century thing to kind of, ah, well, yeah, it's hospitality. Let's dish it out to whoever. Yeah. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. So if you were Catholic, yes. you would disagree with Pope John the Twenty Third in his efforts at ecumenism. Um, not all of them, just everything that runs counter to scripture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, there's you know quite the uproar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, there are still people today in Lutheranism that point back to all of that. Vatican II ruined everything. Oh, for example, upstairs we use the three-year series of readings, A, B, C, right, for Old Testament, Epistle, and New Testament. That's a, kind of a Vatican II, not directly, but, in, but kind of... There always used to be a one-year series. That's it. Same readings, same Sunday each year, one year. And there still are people today. Oh, you use the Vatican system. Like, ah, I get it. I, all right, fine. It was, it was the first 700 times it was kind of humorous, but now it's just old. Yeah. But, um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, let's pray and let you go. More discussion on closed communion next week. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your word, divine, inspired, and errant. It is the rule and norm for faith and life. We thank you that your word shapes and forms us into the Christians you would have us be. Now, as we go forth into the world, we pray that you'd fill us with your wisdom, by your spirit, through your means of grace, that we would communicate Christ to a lost and dying world. We pray in his holy name. Amen. Good stuff. More next week. <laughs>